Welcome to CGTN Live. Good evening. I'm Dean Yang. I'm here. I'm standing in the city of Guangzhou, uh, southern Chinese city. And behind me, with on the camera, you can see is the Raven of Paul, one of the master scene tourist attractions in Guangzhou. And what I'm trying to highlight for you is beyond the river, look into the darkness. Actually, it's not darkness anymore because the landscape is filling with skyscrapers. I mean, if you just focus on those tall buildings for a minute, you could just pretend that this place is Manhattan or any of those famous buzzing, financially buzzing cities in the world. And uh, another scene I'd like to introduce you to see with us, with the CGTN, is the Tower of Guangzhou. And uh, with it, I'd like to tell you why we're here tonight. I mean, if within the camera, you can look a little bit on the top of the tower, it says I mean, I'll just give it, a, I'll give it a minute. Let's wait until the English letters appear. Uh, <laughs> I guess it's going to take another one. Well, I can give you a review you the answer. Now is the time for the, global, the Fortune Global Forum. In t uh, from today into the next uh, two days, I mean, this Guangzhou, this city, uh, uh, has been witnessing the gathering of the world's richest people. The, bosses and the businessmen from the top 500 most famous and richest uh, companies and the gathering in the city talking about the future of the world's second largest economy and also talking about how they can play a part in that future and the timing of this uh, forum is very important because it's right after it's after uh, the national congress of the communist party of china now by coming here, those tycoons, those businesses, those companies, they are showing their confidence in Chinese economy and that they don't want to miss on that train. And another reason we are here tonight is I'm about to show you is over there. That is a temporary studio of CGTN. Tonight we are going to throw you a party of discussion, the panel discussions about these important subjects and, uh, uh, and all those important points coming up during today's uh, Fortune Global Forum. And uh, the show is going to uh, be on a television channel in about a half a minute. And uh, don't go away, stay tuned to CGT and stay tuned to all our digital platforms. We are going to present you this panel discussion with Chen Lei on all our digital platforms as well as a TV channel. And in the meantime, if you have any questions you'd like to ask in relation to the forum, just uh, Leave your questions or comments on our Facebook accounts, on CGTN's application, and uh, via email also on Twitter and the, and the micro blog as well. And we will give, we will give your questions to Cheng Lei, our host, uh, during the break, and she will pick one of those questions or two of those questions to answer you live. Okay, now I'll let's wrap up here, and uh, don't go away. Keep watching. The show is about to begin. It doesn't get any more spectacular than this. This is Guangzhou at its best. Such a pleasant evening. Welcome to Global Business. I'm Chen Lei. We have a jam-packed special show for you. Of course, behind me, as you can see, the glittering Pearl River, which for centuries has been a symbol of new ideas and new frontiers. And that's exactly what we're going to discuss today on the special show. How openness and innovation are going to take us far much further than we are now and joining me in well this beautiful studio uh, with this glittering backdrop uh, let me introduce to you Ms. Ms. Li Yinuo, China Director of the Gates Foundation, Eric uh, Fearworld, CEO of Syngenta and Mr. Andrew Robb, former Australian Trade Minister and Derek Xiong, co-founder of Ehang. Welcome to the show to you all. So we're talking about openness and innovation, which is the theme of this year's Fortune Global Forum, which was also in China's 19th NPC uh, Party Work Report. So let me ask you first, Yinor, what do you do in your work, in your organization that symbolizes innovation? Hmm. Thank you for the question. Uh, so Gates Foundation, the fundamental value we hold is um, all lives have equal value, value and then everybody deserves a, deserve a chance for a healthy and productive life. 
Um, but when we are actually in day-to-day -day work, really, you know, we're facing a lot of challenges in bringing everybody to a healthy and productive life. So innovation is a big theme of our work, meaning how do we not only on the macro level, micro level in terms of bringing products and di diagnostics and new technology to this problem, also on a more micro level, how do you work across sectors, like between government, private sector and social sector and bringing innovative solutions to some of the toughest challenges the world faces. Like healthcare, like vaccines. Indeed. Mm -hmm. And in, in <laughs> agri-tech, of course, you would know a thing or two about that, Mr. Fearworld. Yes, and, and at Syngenta, I think the best innovation that we do is when we bring our leading seeds technology together with our crop protection products and digital tools to work with farmers and help the farmers grow better crops to ensure quality food with significantly less greenhouse gas emissions and less water use and cleaner water. So we can get all of that together with the, with the latest innovations. I'll ask you a bit more about GMO in just a little bit, but for <laughs> now, Mr. Rob, when one thinks of government where you used to work, one doesn't usually associate it with innovation, but while you were the trade minister, you helped to see to fruition the uh, China-Australia Free Trade Agreement, which has been a phenomenal success. Mm. Tell us about innovation in government. Well, innovation in trade and investment, that's, I've been out of politics now for 15 months. I've been concentrating uh, on a number of these trade agreements um, and trying to foster trade and investment between all these countries in a region that's experiencing an unbelievable economic revolution. And, uh, but there's different cultures, uh, different languages, all the rest of it. And how do you build trust in trade and investment to because the world, you know, it, it relies on trust. Business relies on trust. Your family life relies on trust. Um, and so I've been um, trying to um, carry a lot of companies with me in both China and Australia, and Japan and Australia, etc. cetera, um, building, having techniques in a deal which builds trust. Right. And Mr. Xiong, you combined drones and autonomous driving, basically, in these drone taxis. Yeah. Tell us how that innovation came about. Right, so what we are doing is all about innovation. So uh, we came up with the world's very first autonomous aero vehicle, which is an autonomous flying, self-driving um, aircraft or drone that actually carry a passenger. So you can just fly with a drone that you don't need a piloting license. That's what we do. So we tested you know, in all the different cities like Dubai. So we tested early this year in Dubai and also Guangzhou, here in Guangzhou. Uh, we test it every day, like nowadays. And uh, actually one interesting fact is like, one, one of the vice mayor of Guangzhou city was one of our <laughs> passengers who used to sit and we fly him up around the Guangzhou city. So that's, that's what we do. Okay, that was a vote of confidence. Yeah. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so let me uh, get to the second round of questions, which is basically, we talk a lot about innovation, but really, I mean, how easy is it to foster innovation in an organization when it comes to, and you said, you know, combining the social sector, the government sector, and the private sector all together. Surely there are so many barriers. There's, there's so much resistance to innovation. Yeah, absolutely. I think one example I can share is probably in China. This year we started a um, building an institute called Global Health Drug Discovery Institute in Beijing. And in the way, the context is that although there are a lot of money and a lot of interest in new drug discovery, but in reality, lots of them are concentrated in areas and disease areas that actually has a market. But on the, in, the, in reality, 90% of the world communicable diseases are in, in developing countries, but less than 10% of R&D are spent on these diseases, simply because you know, their ab ability to pay is very low. So the whole um, um, intention for this uh, discovery center is to bring best technology you know, from around the world uh, with the talent that China has now in life science and drug discovery and with the local support from, in this case, the Beijing municipal government who not only uh, provided funding uh, with which you know, we are matching but also with a lot of you know, like support to make this institute land in Beijing. Um, so this is in, in a way really a innovation bringing down the barrier between sort of private sector research institutions and the government in working together, hopefully, you know, laying the foundation in solving some of the bigger challenges. Okay, so combining best practices. And uh, what about in agritech? I said I would ask you about GMO. I mean, GMO really in China has, uh, you know, gets a bad rap. Um, <laughs> why is that? And, you know, how hard is it to, to push to sell innovation? Uh, GMO is one of the innovations that we use to advance seed technology. 
and it's, it is very safe. It's been used for 17 years. Over two trillion meals of GMO produced food have been eaten without any idea of any safety concerns. So there has, it's been very proven safe and very effective. In China, GMO products are used in, in papayas to protect papaya against disease and in some other crops. But um, we also have other technologies like genome editing. CRISPR is a, is a most recent technology that's heavily used in China to develop new, new products that we're using that really, without taking a gene from another organism, you just advance the breeding of a, of an ex, of a plant itself. And you can do a lot more to make the plant grow faster, higher yields, and protect itself against diseases and other problems, so have higher quality food and more productivity to help the farmer profitability, but also to help the consumers. Right, so while we're talking about the idea of breaking down barriers, you work with a lot of Chinese companies going to Australia and vice versa. You know, do you think you have to break down the cultural barriers first before they can accept innovative ideas? Um, <clears throat> it's a very big part of it. Um, in order to accept the, the difficulties of setting up a business in another country with a different culture and a different language, etc., you have to make an investment. I see companies in Australia, they'll spend three years fostering a relationship with someone in the next city in order to ultimately come together and do a deal and, and uh, have a joint venture. Yet they come to China and they think if they can't find a decent partner in a week, something's wrong, right? So that we've got to change the mindset um, about investing in understanding the cultures, understanding uh, or appreciating building mutual respect that's what it is we don't want everyone to be the same we just want uh, people to appreciate the strengths of other people and to enjoy the, you know what they bring that you haven't got so uh, it's happening but it's it's slow I just say one thing though that you mentioned that you know politics is not usually associated with innovation um, and that's that's true but there's I've noticed a phenomena that's existing which never has in history, and the digital age is leading and pushing it, and that is that the huge, um, highly uneducated, poverty-stricken element in some communities, sometimes millions, hundreds of millions of people, for the first time in history ever, they know what they're missing out on because of the mobile phone. They've all got the mobile phone. Yeah. And it is fundamentally changing the political pressures. It's what's driving uh, trade Change. investment in the Asian region because all of the politicians, no matter what their political system, they've all got pockets of uh, disadvantaged people who now know what they're missing out on symmetry. and they'll be a real problem politically for those governments unless th these things are fixed. Mm -hmm. And what about you? I mean, you basically started out with a pretty radical mm -hmm. idea that exactly. nobody had tested before. Mm -hmm. Did people try to talk you out of it? Right. It's actually, you know, surprisingly, people are pretty much open-minded for it, especially on the government side. So that's because two years ago when we launched for the very first time this passenger drone, you know, this aero taxi in Las Vegas, uh, right after we launched it, right? So there's tons of government, you know, huge companies came and approached us and say, hey, we want to, you know, work with you. So that's why we started to work with Dubai because Dubai is definitely one of the most uh, aggressive, you know, government in terms of they really want to make 25% of their whole, you know, like domestic city trips, you know, um, into uh, autonomous ones, including both aerial and self-driving cars. So um, by, by 2030, okay? So the other one is China, right? So people traditionally thought China government are being more conservative, you know, for new technology, but that's not true. I mean, I mean for today. So, uh, for the airspace restrictions. Are especially there. for airspace, right? So Civil Aviation Administration China, CAC, the so-called China FAA, okay? <laughs> so they, you know, they heard of our company, they heard of us, and they came to, they formed a special group of experts and specialists and came and visited our company about three months ago. And they thought, this is cool, this is great. So we work together nowadays to, you know, we work together to come up with the roadmap on like you know where we are going and how this thing is going to change the you know aviation industry 
So I think China does benefit a lot from the fast growth of internet industry, and I think that's kind of like what we're experiencing today. Yes, it's uh, adoption is certainly a lot faster yeah. in China for new technologies. Thank you so much. I'm going to give our wonderful panelists just a wee little break for them to get a drink of water. We'll be back in one minute, and uh, don't forget to get your questions in uh, online on all our digital platforms. Stick around. Images may appear to be identical, but looks can be deceiving. The difference is not always obvious. It has to be discovered. There are always different sides to a story. We put the focus on the details. To see more, to understand better. See GTN. See the difference. Ideas nurtured by creative energy, free to flourish. As China embarks on a new journey of opening up and innovation, the best of global business gather to strategize. CGTN takes you to Guangzhou, pioneer of progressive policies. Experience the entrepreneurial buzz at the Fortune Global Forum, Guangzhou. Only on CGTN. You're back with Global Business in Guangzhou. We're talking about openness and innovation, and we have an innovation right here. Not only are we uh, in a new studio outside, but we also have some questions from our, um, from our viewers uh, that are sent online. So let me read out the one for Eno, who is uh, sitting to my left, of course, ladies first. Uh, and this question is, what is Bill Gates like to work for? Wow. I think we all want to know that. <laughs> Does he really eat just chicken nuggets? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and burgers. Uh, yeah, it was very interesting. So when he was uh, in um, Beijing in March this year, he, had, he did an interview. And then the, one of the questions is that if you were to use three words to des describe yourself, um, which words would you choose? Um, and his three words were um, reader, learner, and teacher. Wow. Okay. I was very impressed, and because it also really reflect a lot of, of him. So he's almost on two extremes for me. One, he's super smart and then super super in, into details. So, super nerdy. So, well, indeed. So everybody was actually very nervous working for him. So like, there's a sort of legend basically talking about any team go seeing because we have about twenty something strategies every year. We all through go through uh, strategy review. And um, he seemed to know every strategy deeper than the strategy team themselves. <laughs> That's <laughs> so people scary. are very nervous, yeah, getting to his presentation. So like you know, because he know all the details, and he would go back and forth, and then you know check your footnote, and then you know make sure the number align. Anyway, so that's one on the one end. So super nerdy, very smart into details. On the other hand, he's he's a super big thinker, right? So he sees the system that's probably sometimes invisible to others. Um, and he would, you know, like I think one of the big examples that inspired me personally a lot uh, is the uh, effort to start Gavi in 2000 when the foundation started, right? Back then it was a 750 million uh, investment to build this new mechanism of pulling together suppliers of vaccines to demand in 70, in 70 different countries, working with, um, back then, the UK um, <coughs> DFID, <coughs> Welcome Trust, and also part of the foundation money with WHO. So it was really a big play, but that actually ended up now, I think, saving millions of lives. I think the, the, the data shows there are hundreds of millions of um, uh, vaccines being uh, uh, distributed because of the Gavi mechanism. So I think that's really inspiring as well. And then on you know, the other sort of footnote, or maybe a big one, is he's actually very sensitive and he's uh, emotional at times. And then I remember... Good have thought. I know, because he was here in China when, when we had one of the um, uh, videos around uh, Madame Peng, uh, who is the you know, ambassador for HIV TB, um, you know, ab about HIV orphan uh, kids. And then there was a seven minute movie around like the summer camps that she's been doing on that. And then Bill was watching it, and then I was sort of next to him, and he was like wiping tears Ooh, <laughs> when I was watching. Right. So it was very, The yeah. softer Bill. No, indeed, right. indeed. I think it's like a sort of the, you know, in Chinese, da ai or bigger love or deeper kind of, Mm -hmm. um, you know, care for the, you know, for human being. I think that's really touching for me as well. It is. Eric, we've got a question. How does Syngenta make our food taste better? 
<laughs> which is, after all, you know, the whole point of agritech. I think consistency is a, a big part of that. You know, in, in China, there's a, a food safety, food quality, and food quantity challenge because we have to import a lot of the to of feed the food, 1.4 billion people. Yeah, f to feed <laughs> so many people, but also there's concerns about the safety and the quality. So I, I think with 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 the modern tools that that farmers can use and teaching them to use it and the digital ability to, to use the digital tools to track how they farm, we can assure not only the quality and the quantity, increase the quantity, but also the environmental safety. So, so it, it reduce the greenhouse. 30% of greenhouse gas emissions come from agriculture. 70% of the world's fresh water use is used in agriculture. So when you look at the big challenges that China has, food safety, quality, and including the taste, environmental greenhouse gas climate change, and water. We can address all three with the right modern technologies that, that, that come with agriculture that we can bring. And we want, we want Chinese innovation to bring to these big challenges in, in Chinese agriculture. We can, we can solve these things, including the taste. Okay. <laughs> and the next one is also related to food, to uh, Mr. Rob. Do you think China-Australian trade will grow much more? And will Australian foods become cheaper for Chinese consumers? Uh, indeed. I think because of um, the relationship, if we do get Chinese capital into Australia, we've always been capital thin in Australia, shorter capital, because too few people to save enough money to fund all of the opportunities, right? So Nobody wants to be a farmer anymore in Australia. No, well, <laughs> uh, I'm going to change that, but because um, <laughs> the, capital, the capital can, we could produce twice as much as we produce now um, if we applied uh, a lot of the innovation and technology that's av available uh, appropriately, right? So th that's going to change, but the, with Australia and China, um, very complementary economies. So, of course, the resource and energy, that'll continue at a very high level for decades and much longer. Uh, but agriculture, as people move into the middle class, they want premium, high quality, clean, green agriculture. We're already producing record levels of that for China. But once they've got the protein, they want what? Health. Now, we're a first world country with health, and we've got so much we can do with China to um, help them improve uh, their health systems and of course there's education there's a lot of innovation needed and possible with with innovation then they want recreation once they've got all those things and tourism and uh, a lot of recreation activities uh, again complementary in terms of what we offer one another so uh, there's a bright future for, for for two countries. Two, so the answer is basically yes. Yeah, very much so, very <laughs> right. much so. Yeah. Okay, and the question for you, Derek, is after drone taxis, what other creative transport can we expect? Mm. Is that in the pipeline? Or right, so I think drone taxi, we're, you know, it's, 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 it's quite close, but we're not there yet, right? So, uh, I don't know, probably the airspace. <laughs> Yeah, but going uh, into space. Yeah, but there's, but there are, are are other you know drone applications because today people use drones mostly for the aerial filming photography. as a you know as a photography as a camera. Yeah. But and what we pesticides. do, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So mm -hmm. what, but we we kind of explore you know the you know the different applications of the drones and what drone can what can drone do you know actually. So what we do actually early this year in Guangzhou City, just behind us, in, on top of this Zhujiang River. We used to perform this over a thousand units of drones swarming performance, like a formation performance. That mm -hmm. each drone carry a LED light. That you see a huge logo change into different shapes or forms, mm -hmm. and we actually eventually make it into a media company. So oh. that's something that's really interesting. And okay. we're still nowadays the record holder uh, so for this, like a innovating into media yeah innovating into media Fantastic. exactly so there are other applications as well right next time i'm going to ask a sort of a borderline personal question which is we all talk about trying to become more open-minded more innovative you know what are some tools that help you personally to to do that to not stay within your comfort zone all the time to come up with the big ideas mm. well for me i think um this is something I always strive to get better at. Uh, and the one thing really helps me uh, personally is really seeing the world in different angles. Um, and personally, I actually you know, started in the private sector. I was with McKinsey. I was a partner there for 10 years. And then this last two years with Gates Foundation and also a li little bit with my adventure into education. 
um, it was it really brought me to see very different things. I remember when I was at McKinsey, I thought, okay, I've seen the world, right? So I've I've been to like all the continents. I've served you know Fortune 500 companies, been to CEOs' offices. You know, like what else do I not know? <laughs> um, until when I came to Gates Foundation, well, you know, we work on TB, and I didn't know there are 100 million cases of uh, you know one, uh, one million cases in TB in China. I was like, I thought it's gone. Right, and working malaria, and then I, I found out there are 200 million people who get malaria every year. I was like, 200 million, right? And then 600,000 of them die, and most of them are um, pregnant women and uh, and kids. And then, and also there are problems like um, you know the you know disease is a big one, and then also poverty, and also like uh, water sanitation. I realized like 25, the 2.5 billion people who has no access to clean water, right? So. Sometimes you think those big numbers, I was like, wow, I was really blind, right? Makes me want to join the Gates Foundation. <laughs> no, indeed, right? So I feel like, you know, there's so, you know, so little effort compared to the big challenges we have. Um, and education is the same, because I think education is because it's about human race's future, right? So, but on the other hand, when you think about it, you know, there are technology, there are funding, but it's, it's really back to, you know, bring, bring you very humble, because it's back to humanity. Like, what is it to become a human, right? Human being, how do you, like, support a, you know, like a baby to grow up? So I think it's really, really opening your, like, for me personally, kind of really seeing different things gave me different perspectives. And when you have these different perspectives, you put things, you know, you know, in the right scale, and then now you know, give you at least a bigger vision, and then also um, different ways to think about uh, innovation to in other solve words, some of them. Change careers and have children. Exactly <laughs> right. <laughs> and what about you, Eric? I think tra traveling around the world and listening to in agriculture to farmers, but uh, also to scientists talking to NGOs, you know, we work with the Gates Foundation to address malaria and also hunger in Africa and other parts of the world. So it's, it's, it's just getting out and listening to, to talking to people. Taking off your angles. CEO hat. Yeah, and, and just <laughs> talking about what are the big problems and how can we solve them? And there's so many different ideas, even this forum. I mean, there are brilliant people from all over the world here coming to Guangzhou and talking about the big problems of the world and, and seeing the incredible progress that China has made in innovation, and that just gives us all optimism about these things can be solved. That's right, about a, a cash work society. together. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Mr. Rob, I mean, you've had a fairly big career change as well. Do you think that's really opened your mind, uh, or, you know, <laughs> or was it fairly open to start with? Well, I've had a very eclectic career, full stop, so um, of which, 12 years was you know, as a parliamentarian, but um, I personally, um, I'm a visual person, and the, not unlike Eric, with the, if I force myself to go and see people, I'll, and I'll read a snippet about something uh, like what Derek's doing, all right, and then, but it <laughs> yeah, won't. And you immediately was, you were writing it down. It in won't stick in my head and um, until I go and have a look, and then it might lead to another thought altogether. Uh, from the stimulation from that, unrelated perhaps to drones, but uh, you know, you learn things that you can apply in other areas. But I have to go, to be really stimulated, uh, I have to go and see, see these things and talk to people. Yeah, touch things. And you? Yeah, I mean, my whole career is about doing startups. I started my first company when I was in high school. and uh, What was that about? That was uh, selling phone card. <laughs> That's the first business. Very entrepreneurial. Very yeah, very yeah, very important. And I started the other, you know, another two companies during college. And uh, Yihan is actually one of the the very first, I would say, established company, you know, that I co-founded together. So, but I'd love to kind of elaborate more about, you know, like so for me as a kind of like the so-called '80s or the you know the, the early '90s uh, generation. I think we're really lucky enough to be born you know at this age because I've been lucky enough to travel around the world I see I talk to all the young people around the world from different countries what I figured out is like no matter it's in the developed countries or developing countries you can't really find another you know um, huge startup ecosystem other than Silicon Valley um, in the rest of the world and China definitely is one of the biggest ecosystem and the new generation of kids they're very different from the I hate to say this, but the older you know, generation. <laughs> That's all of us. It's okay. Entrepreneurs. No, no, Businessmen, like entrepreneurs, right? Because yes. they're born with the like fast. Like Eric. Yeah. Because <laughs> they're born with the fast, you know, um, growing stage of the internet, right? So they're born to be confident. They're born to be global. So they're, they're not afraid of anything. So that's really, 
you know, something I think that's important, um, you know, for, for, for grassroots entrepreneurs. And uh, so I do believe that this is the best time for young Chinese generation to kind of pursue their, you know, career as an entrepreneur to make their dream eventually come true. Okay, speaking of dreams, I've been asked, I've been told we've got about one and a half minutes to go. So <laughs> I want to get a little snippet from each of you about what your wish list is for this world to become more open, more innovative. More equality. Good. Well, I would just say now, eight months ago, we were bought by Chem China. <laughs> and so we're now a Chinese company headquartered in Switzerland. And, I, and we're, we're an agriculture innovation company, innovations at our core. But now we want to tap into the innovation potential and heartland of, of China. So we're, we're, we're really glad to be Chinese owned at this time of, in history. Fantastic. And Mr. Rob? Well, uh, I see a region that's um, you know, re-emerging in many respects. And um, the opportunities and what's happening is unprecedented. Um, maintaining uh, peace and stability across the geopolitical changes that are going to inevitably occur mm -hmm. to me is the, the very big issue because history without that you've got nothing history is littered with um, changes in power structures which uh, involve massive conflict but there are examples where it hasn't and uh, that's what we should be aiming for in this region wonderful and Derek well I'm a huge believer in technology so I believe that the technology will eventually kind of bridge the gap among the different countries you know all the people yeah. okay thank you so much to all our panelists Enor and Eric and Derek and Mr Andrew Rob thank you so much and I hope you enjoy the rest of the forum in Guangzhou so that's going to do it for our special edition of global business in Guangzhou we've got more coming up for the rest of the week signing out from this glittering backdrop here over the Pearl River I'm Jalei Okay, well, but welcome back with the Dean Yang. We are still live on CGTN's all sorts of digital platforms, and uh, now the temperature in Guangzhou is uh, is uh, cool. It's uh, a little bit freezing actually, but thank God uh, the panelist discussion isn't. I and mean, if you, uh, I hope that from the panelist discussion, you've get some answers to your questions about the uh, the Fortune Forum and also the globalization, all the big subjects. But if you haven't, and don't go away. We have some. We've got a bit of extra time, and then the host Cheng Wei just. Uh, uh, told me that actually we can step on the center stage to ask a few more questions. Uh, hi guys. I'd like to give it a heads up. We're still live on CGT and so all sorts of digital platforms. So, how are you feeling about that? Okay, I would like to share my microphone with you. Okay, uh, a little bit tricky. Let me uh, unwire myself. <laughs> so, just some simple questions, no worries. I mean, how do you like Guangzhou? Oh, beautiful city. Okay. Uh, I, I, last time I was here was 15 years ago. The change in 15 years is unprecedented in the world. Okay, so um, just lay to you. Uh, yeah, much warmer than Beijing, so I like it. <laughs> oh my god, it just makes me a liar because I just told the audience that the temperature is going to be freezing at the moment. So <laughs> allow me to pass you the temporarily and uh, I'll come back to you later. That's all right. I'll try to, you know, try to. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, so that I won't inter uh, interrupt with the, the lighting. Well, yeah. So, so your impression of the city? Yeah, I live here. So, <laughs> oh my! <laughs> so our company I mean, that, is that actually gives you a unique <laughs> position to answer this question. You need to be very, very careful. Objective. Okay. Yeah. Right. Right. So I think it's a big city with uh, you know beautiful mm -hmm. sceneries and especially with uh, you know I think the city is you know. With, probably the most like open-minded city in terms mm -hmm. of you know like uh, having people from all over the province of China mm -hmm. living here and kind of like li live here and work here together yeah and uh, you sir my impressions yeah, yeah. well I, I always love a city with uh, with a big river mm -hmm. through it um, it sort of brings a connection to everything that's along the river and outside of it. So I know you've, uh, you've flown a long way to be here to attend this to the, the forum. Allow me to ask you know, one more question. Do you think this is the best city to hold such an event? <laughs> it's a, it's an obvious choice. I mean, there's a, no, look, it's um, certainly in Australia. It's Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou. Mm -hmm. They're the cities that are 
well known where people want to you know, make a starting point for their exploration of China. So uh, it's already got a very established reputation. As was said earlier, what's the change that's taking place here is just absolutely phenomenal and uh, enjoyable without uh, sacrificing some of the cultural elements and historic elements of this uh, community. Thank you, Mr. President, and to our praising of the city, I'd like to invite and host Mr. Chen Lai over here because this is not the the only episode of this panelist discussion. Into the oh, be careful! I know it's a very heated discussion. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So calm down, calm down, Still calm down. From I will the, try uh, to speak for another four seconds just to give you some time so to cool down a little bit. I'm too into yeah. the next two days, you will still be able to watching CGTN and watching this panelist discussion with the Chen Lei. But I like now to ask your opinion over the two biggest subjects of the two, sorry, the themes of this year's Fortune uh, Global Forum: openness and innovation. So we know that openness now is threatened by. Uh, various countries and they're threatening to either shut their doors or in uh, various ways to kind of make the negotiation, the trade negotiation harder. And innovation's problem is and now the innovations are fast, but the, the force of innovation, power economy seems to be, you know, slowing down and uh, to be losing its momentum. How do you view those problems? Not at all. No? I think technology is overpowering the uh, political <laughs> pressures. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I guess there was a lot of pessimism when Trump came into power and that was right after the Brexit. But I think over the past uh, year or two, you saw that businesses still believe in globalization. Businesses still believe in openness and innovations are breaking down barriers. I mean, how AVs operate in Dubai without openness. Uh, you know, how would Syngenta be bought by a Chinese company, Chem China, without openness? And, you know, all of our guests, all the work that they do, and including us, we're available to more than 100 countries around the world, you know, to more than 350 million households. How could that be possible without a lot? Of, I'm talking about a lot of faith. Okay. In that is up. that is the benefit of coming up on this show. You all get a spe you all get the smell smell on by a beautiful host here. <laughs> and then we're going to have another two panelists discussion uh, in the next two days. So can we have a little bit of a given away? Uh, uh, yeah, on right. what is going to happen uh, tomorrow? Okay, so on Thursday evening, uh, tune in for our theme which is the future of manufacturing and we call it made in China made for the world because really I mean where is manufacturing going so many manufacturers don't call themselves and don't look like traditional manufacturers anymore I was speaking to Terry Go you know the chairman of the world's largest electronics contract manufacturer the other day he says I have reinvented myself my company three times already mm -hmm. and um, you know, talking to other manufacturers or traditional manufacturers like General Electric, they are now so much more about collaborating, about working with governments, with other companies to come up with solutions. And, uh, you know, and a lot of their products are not that tangible. So the future of manufacturing is fascinating. You really, so want we've to, got you really want to slow down a little bit. That is a very generous tease. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. And then on Friday, tuning for Win With China because all too often it can seem like a zero-sum game, but of course it isn't. And we have got, uh, you know, company representatives from, for example, the CEO of WMEIMG China, They're one of the world's largest entertainment agency companies. And, you know, what they're doing here, representing athletes, representing uh, entertainers, and this is such a vibrant market for entertainment. Yes, I'm going too far with my T's again, but you, you get what I'm saying. You get a flavor. I hope all the challenges have said they would be able to hook you up before the show for the next two days. And uh, don't go away because uh, from today and into the next two days, we'll, we at CGT and we'll bring you more coverage on the forum. And in the meantime, if you like, if you like to participate in our coverage, uh, uh, you're welcome to leave your comments and your questions on all CGT's digital platforms, including Facebook, a microblog, a Twitter, YouTube, all that you can think of. And uh, stay tuned to us. Don't go away for the next two days. And thank you. Hope you'll find this panelist discussion as rewarding as I do. Okay? See you soon. Good night. Thank you. Thank you.